From a and this is Biography. The odds are that every day of your life, somehow, somewhere, you hear the music of Ludwig von Beethoven. His masterpieces reach out to all of us. Beethoven reached out to very few. His was a life of isolation. And yet it was out of that cauldron of personal despair that rose angelically such music. It is hard to understand it. It is hard to describe it without using the one word that applies to Beethoven as much as anyone ever born on this earth. Beethoven had genius. Beethoven's music has electrified audiences for two centuries. Genius is what possesses a man. Beethoven was possessed. He's able to elevate us in a way nobody else can because he went through hell. Beethoven struggled through hearing loss, abuse, and heartbreak. But the music kept playing in his head. His passion saved his life and changed music forever. Ludwig van Beethoven was born into a musical family in the sleepy town of Bonn, Germany in 1770. Bonn was a quiet outpost of the simmering Holy Roman Empire. Revolt was in the air and would soon spread across Europe. The aristocrats who had ruled for centuries didn't realize it, but their world was on the verge of collapse. However, conservative Bonn was still a refuge from the turmoil, and the Bonn court was the aristocrat's palace. The palace's musical director was the brilliant Ludwig van Beethoven, the grandfather of the great composer who shares his name. Grandfather Ludwig tried to pass on some of his musical talents to his son, Johann. But Johann turned out to be a mediocre musician and a surly alcoholic. Johann and his loving but meek wife, Maria, had three boys, Ludwig, the eldest, Caspar, and Nicholas. The shy and intense young Ludwig showed early signs of musical talent, and his father set out to teach him the piano. But his lessons were cruel. When he played wrong notes, or the phrasing was wrong, or the music was not what the father wanted to hear, Beethoven would get a slap, a shove, a punch. We know that the father locked him in the, in the basement, in the cellar, several times when he didn't perform in the way that he was supposed to. Despite his drunken father's rough teaching, by age five, Beethoven showed a lot of promise. His father dreamed of turning him into the next Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. A few years earlier, Mozart's family had trotted their seven-year-old musical prodigy around Europe, performing concerts, bringing in money and fame. Johann Beethoven thought he had another Mozart on his hands, and he hoped to cash in. He wanted his son to be something more than he was. All his ambitions, all his crushed ideals for himself, I think he focused on his kid. Young Beethoven was talented, but musically, he was no Mozart. Besides, Johann was too drunk and disorganized to spin his son's music into gold, and would more often beat him than inspire him. On many nights, Johann would come home drunk and wake his son up to play piano for him, or risk a beating. What is a miracle here is the fact that Beethoven didn't turn off to music. I think basically he was in love with music itself, and that overrode anything that anybody could do to him. Beethoven's abusive home took a lasting toll. 
He always had sort of in the back of his mind that the world is a dangerous place. He learned early on that it's difficult to trust other people. He shied away from his harsh family life and from his classmates in grade school as well. He was a loner and cut a shabby figure as a child, wearing raggedy clothes and a surly expression. He couldn't focus in school, but threw himself passionately into practicing his piano. A morose, unhappy child who spoke to no one, who practiced best when he was by himself, but was frankly terrified of having to deal with other people. He became a good enough pianist to give his first public concert when he was only seven years old. The recital was a success. A court musician named Christian Neef was in attendance and was deeply impressed. Neef became Beethoven's teacher and set out to put him on the path to greatness. Neef taught him the music of the masters, like Johann Sebastian Bach and Joseph Haydn. Beethoven was an eager pupil. Not only did he have this sort of fire of inspiration, but he also had this incredible determination that everything that he composed should be the best that it could be. Finally, at age 10, Beethoven quit school to devote himself solely to music. He was inspired by the vibrant cultural climate of late 18th century Europe, known as the Enlightenment era. Rebellious and popular intellectuals like Immanuel Kant and Voltaire preached about liberty and railed against the aristocrats who had ruled Europe for centuries. The teenage Beethoven was dazzled by these Enlightenment rebels and spent many nights in coffee houses like this one near his home, debating the views of his enlightened heroes. He grew up in an atmosphere where you could talk and think aloud for the first time. It allowed him, if you like, to break the rules in music, just as everyone else was breaking the rules in all other areas. By his early teens, he was anxious to break out of the conventions of classical music. He explored new rhythms and melodies and wrote some striking compositions, like this Juvenalia Sonata. Beethoven said, no more of this, music is entertainment. What Beethoven is saying is that music has the power to transform people. His tutor, Christian Neef, took out an ad in 1783 in a music magazine urging Bonn's aristocrats to sponsor his pupil to go to glittering Vienna, musical capital of the world. Neef promised that Beethoven was a genius who would no doubt become another Mozart. At last, in 1787, a group of noblemen pooled their money for their hometown rising star. The restless 16-year-old left the musical hinterlands of Bonn in March of that year, hungry to prove himself in glamorous Vienna, the toughest test of all. Vienna in 1787 was the undisputed cultural capital of Europe. The arts were flourishing as aristocrats lavished money and courtly favors on artists of all kinds. For years, Beethoven had yearned to go and prove himself there. Above all, he wanted to meet Vienna's reigning god of classical music, Wolfgang Mozart. Just days after arriving, 16-year-old Beethoven used his connections to get a chance to play piano for Mozart in this room. His brilliant playing stunned the great master. Mozart just could not believe what he was witnessing. Mozart actually left the room and went into the next room where his wife was entertaining friends, and he said, watch out for this boy. One day he will give the world something to talk about. Beethoven was thrilled to have impressed his childhood hero and hoped to study with him. But their first meeting would also be their last. <laughs> 
Just two weeks after arriving in Vienna, Beethoven's mother grew ill with tuberculosis, and he had to rush back to Bonn. That summer of 1787, she died. Beethoven was torn in his feelings for the woman who loved him, but couldn't protect him from his father's abuses. Beethoven's father was devastated by his wife's death and took to drinking more than ever. His condition got so bad that two years later, in 1789, Beethoven took desperate measures. Just 18, he formally became head of the household, responsible for his two younger brothers and a father he despised. His father was always getting into drunken brawls and Beethoven had to go and sort it out. And really, it was a dreadful burden for a teenage boy. The pressures of running his family made Beethoven bitter and bad-tempered, traits that he would carry with him his whole life. But the experience also made him a confident and resourceful young man. To pay the family bills, he took a job with the Bonn court. The only opening was for viola, an instrument he barely knew, but learned quickly nonetheless. His finances now more secure, he had time to devote himself intensely to composing. He dedicated a composition to one of his heroes who had just died, the Emperor Joseph II, a beloved Enlightenment leader. The piece was so difficult to play that several musicians refused to perform it, a problem that would follow Beethoven his whole career. The performers just had to fend for themselves. He wasn't really interested in whether things were difficult or easy to play. Maybe he feels the need to let others struggle as well. There's no better explanation for the fact that his writing is so incredibly, intensely uncomfortable. It didn't go from that key to the one you would expect next. It went from that key to a totally remote key. The beat wasn't always on the bar, on the first beat. It was all over the place. The violinist of most of his late quartets said to him, can you try to rewrite it? It's practically unplayable. And Beethoven's famous response to that was, do you think I'd give a damn about your miserable little violin when the muse visits me? Beethoven's music embodied the upheaval shaking Europe. The democratic spirit of the 1789 French Revolution was spreading, and the aristocrats' grip on power was collapsing. But the nobility continued to bankroll Vienna's musicians, and the nobility's musical darling was the legendary composer Joseph Haydn. Haydn was entranced by Beethoven's daring new music and offered in 1792 to become his tutor. The aging veteran immediately took the rising young star back to Vienna to help him win over the nobleman. Beethoven was thrilled. A month after arriving, his father died in Bonn, and he refused to go back for the funeral of a man who had brought him so much grief. 22-year-old Beethoven was in Vienna to stay. He was now focused on courting the aristocrats, and Joseph Haydn was his ticket into their drawing rooms. The next ticket was just Beethoven's own genius, in a sense. When Beethoven played for them, they realized this is something different. On first glance, the rough-mannered and swarthy Beethoven was as far outside the genteel aristocratic world as he could be. He was not a pretty person, about five foot four, pockmarked face from smallpox, very dark skin. His friends called him the Sicilian. Bad hair. But his high energy and brilliant performances vaulted him into the poshest musical circles. By the middle 1790s, just a few years after arriving in Vienna, Beethoven was playing recitals all over town. Now in his middle 20s, he was developing a reputation as a daring newcomer. 
To set himself apart from any rivals, he played a repertoire of devilishly challenging works and attacked the piano with a gusto and intensity the Viennese had never seen before. He developed an art form where emotion was really the first thing that, that hits you. I mean, he tries to throw you off balance. Women would faint, men would weep, things would be hurled down the stage. It was just extraordinary. And Beethoven's way of treating the instrument was so different from what anyone had ever heard as to create instant celebrity for him. Wealthy patrons like Prince Lobkowitz and Count Razumovsky lined up to offer money to Beethoven, no strings attached. This money allowed him to concentrate full time on playing and writing music. But, always the renegade, he made clear to his backers that he could be subsidized, but he could not be bought. These were often substitute families, the families that he never had. At the same time, of course, he wanted to be completely independent of these families. So he would be close one moment and be storming out the next moment. And that is vintage Beethoven behavior. His mood swings and temper were legendary, as familiar as the enchanting music that flowed out of his pen. His brilliant piano playing and swelling ego made him feel that his talents put him on equal footing with the nobleman. Beethoven was convinced that as a creator, he was second only to God. An aristocrat is someone simply born to a title. Beethoven is in many ways the first modern artist, uh, the creator as hero, the creator as a godlike figure, the creator who works not for the commissioner, but who works for their own muse. He occasionally repaid his patrons by dedicating compositions to them, such as the famous Pathetique Sonata he dedicated to his patron, Prince Lichnowsky. But he was not afraid to upbraid his sponsors when they got on his very fragile nerves. After a yet another flaming row he had with Prince Lichnowsky, he stormed out of Lichnowsky's country residence and he left him a note saying, there are many Count Lichnowskys, there is only one Beethoven. And that, in a sense, was the guiding principle of his life. He liked people to speculate that the word van in the middle of his name meant he was of noble birth. In fact, the van meant nothing of the sort. But Beethoven liked his fans to guess at some mystery in his background. At the same time, he despised the nobility. A slight shade of hypocrisy there. But after all, if someone thinks you're related to royalty, you don't summon them all and say, actually, it's not true, is it? In the late 1790s, now in his late 20s, Beethoven solidified his reputation as the star pianist in town by challenging other pianists to high-spirited improvisation contests. Well, along came the great virtuosos of Europe, and they would play against this young man, and he would run them out of town. In just a few years in Vienna, the raggedy young man from the hinterland turned himself into a favorite of the aristocrats. But just as things were taking off for him, he began to hear a ringing in his ears, a noise that grew louder and louder. It would soon engulf his musical world and turn it into silence. Turn of the 19th century Vienna was in the midst of a cultural heyday. One of its major stars was Ludwig van Beethoven. With his wild shock of hair and stern gaze, he was a curious and volatile society darling. In 1800, 30-year-old Beethoven crossed a composer's milestone by writing his first symphony. Critics loved it. Even the first and second symphony already, they are so heavenly and so wonderful that you just feel you're safe. You are living a peaceful life. His growing fame was also bringing Beethoven for the first time in his life 
attention from women. He fell passionately in love with one of his pupils, the Countess Gioletta Giacardi. To woo her, in 1801, he wrote the sublime and delicate Moonlight Sonata. While Giacardi was smitten with Beethoven, she was not about to marry a man with no royal title. She left him to marry a count just two years later, a pattern in Beethoven's life that would repeat itself again and again. Beethoven's spirit was crushed, and his body was now beginning to fail him as well. In his late 20s, he had begun to realize he was losing his sense of hearing, and he was terrified. Beethoven's struggle with the crisis would soon take over his life. His hearing loss made his notorious temper and rages even worse. He would become violent, he would become abusive, and he would become physical. Wild mood swings seemed to have dominated his, his life. Friends and supporters grew worried about his flights of rage. Some were too scared to spend time with him but his pride kept him from telling people about his affliction. When Beethoven began to go deaf, it made life very difficult. He was extremely embarrassed. He didn't want to be laughed at, so for a while he pretended that he could hear things. In the spring of 1802, he retreated to this quaint village outside Vienna called Heiligenstadt, hoping a more natural environment would help cure him. He went to this bathhouse there, and took mineral baths day after day. Doctors were baffled and had him try everything, from swimming in the Danube River and later even inserting giant brass trumpets into his ears to pick up sounds better. But every remedy failed. Beethoven lived in this house, and when he looked out at this church bell and could barely sense it ringing, he knew his hearing would soon be gone altogether. In a heartbreaking letter to his brothers he wrote in the fall of 1802, he confessed his anguish. I am obliged to live like an outcast. If I venture into the company of men, I am overcome with a burning terror. Beethoven never sent the letter. Friends found it stuffed in his desk years after he died. It read like a last will, the words of a man in absolute despair. It would have needed little for me to put an end to my life. It was art only which held me back. He knew how much he still had in him, and Beethoven, for all his unhappiness, had a spark of extraordinary optimism and incredible creative power. The letter marked a major turning point. Having reached the depth of despair, his creative spirit rebounded dramatically. He told friends that his deafness and the anger it brought on made him want to seize fate by the throat. The chaos in his head was reflected in his furiously scrolled music. His fantasy world, his therapist's couch, were his pieces, and he allowed himself to transcend his rage through his music. Music that would, in the next few years, seal his fate as a great composer. Now in his early 30s, he wrote a string of masterpieces, including symphonies, sonatas, and quartets. The music was always in his head. There's so much darkness in his life, but he looked up to find the sun and the light. And despite everything that happened to him, he did succeed. Critics applauded his genius and daring. By sheer force of will, he seemed to be reborn. 
I think it's the character of this man, that he would look something so devastating in the face, I'll never hear another note of music again, and go on creating. One of his next compositions, the grandiose Third Symphony, reflects his soaring confidence. He dedicated it to one of his heroes, Napoleon Bonaparte, the giant of the French Revolution. Beethoven idolized Napoleon for his anti-aristocratic message and identified with him personally as well. For someone who has forsworn his own father, which Beethoven did, Napoleon becomes a brother or a father figure more than just a political figure. Beethoven passionately believed that Napoleon would go on to lift his countrymen into an enlightened, utopian new world. Of course, it was not to be. Just a year later, in 1804, Napoleon expanded his war of conquest across Europe and declared himself Emperor of France. Beethoven felt so betrayed that his hero had turned into a tyrant that he violently tore Napoleon's name off the musical score and retitled it simply Eroica, or Heroic. This is very remarkable. He didn't burn his uh, score of the Third Symphony. He knew exactly that he was dedicating the symphony to the spirit of the uh, revolution, not to one person. Beethoven was carrying on his own musical revolution with his booming Fifth Symphony in 1808, with its famous bold and dynamic opening. Also in 1808, with his deafness closing in on him, 38-year-old Beethoven struggled to recapture the beauty of nature with his sad and delicate pastoral symphony. He scrawled in the margins notes about how the symphony should sound like things he would soon never hear again, like bird songs and wind. He loved the feeling of earth, the sound of birds, the feeling of trees, the sunlight making things grow. And he translated it in his own way that if you just sit back and listen, it all becomes clear to you. Some people believe the pastoral symphony was also inspired by the beautiful countess, Josefina von Brunswick. Beethoven had been in love with her, but, as so many of his aristocratic women would do, she ended their relationship. She would later marry a nobleman. He would seem to have the nerd's unfortunate propensity to be attracted to the captain of the cheerleaders. Beethoven kept falling in love with long, leggy, blonde, married aristocratic ladies. But Beethoven never gave up. In 1812, he fell hopelessly in love once again, writing heart-rending letters to a woman he called simply his immortal beloved. The identity of Beethoven's immortal beloved would become one of the great romantic mysteries of all time. By 1809, Beethoven was 39 years old, and his deafness was advancing rapidly. Barely 10 years after his days as a star pianist on the European stage, he gave a series of disastrous recitals. They made him realize he had to quit playing because he couldn't hear himself anymore. So he turned to composing full time. He had to press his ears into the wood of his piano to create the lustrous Seventh Symphony in 1811. To those close to him, he seemed to be withdrawing into a world in his head, a world of passion, rage, and silent music. But then in the fall of 1811, 
Beethoven fell deeply in love with the beautiful but ailing Antony Brentano, the wife of one of his best friends. She was bedridden, and her friend Ludwig van Beethoven arranged to have a piano placed near her room where he played. This is the fantasy scene, I'm sure, of many a young woman. And they fell genuinely and, and deeply in love. The next year, in 1812, he wrote a heartbreakingly passionate letter to the woman he called simply his immortal beloved. Many scholars think it was meant for Antony Brentano. Even when I am in bed, my thoughts rush to you, my immortal beloved. I must live altogether with you or never see you. Perhaps the intimate revelation scared Beethoven because he never sent the letter. But scholars and musicians have combed over its passionate prose ever since. I sometimes read it again, like some stories in the Bible. If you read it from time to time, I think you are close to him. You understand that he didn't do anything without passion, without total commitment. But, as always, Brentano, a mother of four, was way out of his social class, and their relationship ended. It's a total conflict of emotion, and it never becomes resolved until such time as Beethoven, I think, gives up his idea of ever becoming a family man, of ever becoming a husband, of ever siring uh, children. But Brentano may not be the only candidate for immortal beloved. His former love interest, Countess Josefina von Brunswick, had a daughter about nine months after the immortal beloved letter was written. And the child, who resembled Beethoven, was a musical prodigy. She may have been Beethoven's only child, and the product of what would be his last great love affair. His lover, mistress, wife was his music. There was no room for anyone else. And I suspect deep down he knew that. As he had in the past, he threw his frustrated romantic energies into his music. In 1814, he finished a deeply personal opera called Fidelio. His only opera, it was about a political prisoner rescued from his dark and grim barracks by a beautiful woman. Fidelio is one of the most moving statements of faith in humanity that has ever been created by an artist. And that is what Beethoven was about. Just listen to it, and it will give you faith in humanity. Fidelio premiered in Vienna during the Peace Conference of 1814. Napoleon's armies had been defeated, and the victorious powers promoted Fidelio as a liberation story meant to symbolize newly free Europe. Fidelio was a huge success, and Beethoven, now in his mid-40s, became the toast of the conference. But the next year, in 1815, Beethoven threw himself into a treacherous personal struggle that would shatter his reputation. After his brother Caspar died, Beethoven launched a vicious court battle to gain custody of his brother's eight-year-old son, even though the will designated the boy's mother should take him. But Beethoven was a lifelong bachelor who stayed up late, drank often, and lived an eccentric personal life, hardly the fathering type. He doesn't care how many feelings he hurts, whether it's the boy's own feelings or the mother. He was obsessed and possessed by this for one reason. He wanted to be the father he never had. But Beethoven pursued the battle for five years. At a terrible price to his reputation, he eventually won custody of the boy. And all the litigation show Beethoven at his most selfish, at his most delusional, at his meanest. And it's not a Beethoven we terribly like or want to remember. The custody fight hurt Beethoven further when a careless remark he made during the trial 
revealed that he was not of noble birth. This revelation exposed the fraud about his background that he had allowed to spread for many years. Beethoven was humiliated. In 1820, the grueling custody trials ended and Beethoven's nephew came to live with him. It was a miserable existence for both of them. The boy most of the time hated Beethoven, who was totally unprepared for fatherhood. So Beethoven escaped into his music. In the next few years, he wrote some of the most powerful and sublime music that he and the world would ever know. In 1820, Beethoven was 50 years old and was facing a personal and musical watershed. For the last five years, he had fought a grueling custody battle for his nephew that left him emotionally scarred. And during that time, he composed relatively little. His deafness shut him off from the world so much that he seemed to stop caring what people thought of him and grew increasingly eccentric. The most famous living composer became like a vagabond in the streets of Vienna. He doesn't bathe. He's called insane. Small children throw things at him on the street. He puts a beautiful suit of clothes on, but then keeps that suit of clothes on for the next three weeks. And we find the remains of many meals on those clothes. A series of caricatures made in his lifetime captured the disheveled, often drunk and raggedy genius who meandered the streets like a hobo and then went back to his flat and turned out some of the most lucid and beautiful music ever written. He got arrested as a tramp. He told the jailman, don't you know who I am? I'm Beethoven. The guy said, sure, you're Beethoven. You know, it took all night to get him out of jail. Many of his friends abandoned him as his drinking and temper got worse. And landlords kicked him out when he ruined one apartment after another with piles of sheet music and leftover meals scattered everywhere. From the outside, his life seemed a chaotic mess, but inside his head, the music kept playing. In 1823, he would revive himself by turning to an institution he had ignored most of his life, the church. He dived with typical intensity into learning the history of church music before writing a mass the Misa Solemnis, or Solemn Mass. The Mass set off a spiritual awakening in him that would yet again turn his struggles into triumphs. Well, the music becomes an entire psychological act, a worldview, a way of putting things in order that otherwise could not be put in order. During this period, he wrote a haunting series of intimate string quartets. Then, in 1824, at age 54, he finished his most famous work of all the flamboyant Ninth Symphony. Emerging out of the deep despair of recent years, he reached far into himself to create the passionate and optimistic Ninth. This was written by a deaf man who couldn't overcome the misery of daily life. This is remarkable. The Ninth was revolutionary. The first symphony ever to use a chorus. Beethoven set the finale to the words of the poet Friedrich Schiller's famous Ode to Joy, a soaring hymn to a righteous God and brotherhood between all men. This poem was sort of the bedrock of Beethoven's philosophical and religious beliefs. He believed that God was approachable, that God was a sort of a father. He believed in all of those things. <laughs> 
Tragically, at the premiere of the Ninth in 1824, Beethoven couldn't even hear the raucous ovations from the audience. As they clapped, one of the musicians had to turn him around so he could see them applauding. He never gives up. He had this sense of him struggling and fighting and kind of shaking his fist all the way to the end. But just as his career was soaring, his past struggles came back to haunt him in 1826. His nephew, now a young adult, tried to kill himself. He was found in this ruined castle and he was taken to his mother. Shock horror, not Beethoven, his mother. So Beethoven's life was thrown into turmoil yet again. The boy recovered, but the guilt and stress over the near suicide brought back terrible memories to Beethoven. He had been having severe abdominal pains, made worse from the anxiety. He was trying to write a 10th symphony, but his pain made it too hard to work. On the 22nd of March, 1827, a priest gave him last rites. Five days later, a ferocious storm came out of the sky. Beethoven raised his fist at a thunderbolt ripping through the clouds and collapsed on his bed. The most famous composer of all time was dead. And what did that raised fist mean at the end of Beethoven's life? I think what it meant was, I still have energy. The energy was all spent on that last gesture, but it's the perfect Beethovenian symbol, expression, moment. In his final will, he left everything to his estranged nephew, Karl. So revered was Beethoven at the time of his death that sculptors made a death mask of his face right after he took his last breath. Then his executors cut off all his hair, selling some to his fans at auction. His funeral drew 20,000 people. Ninety-eight percent of the people out there on the streets probably didn't understand anything about music, but he was a hero. He was a great revolutionary hero. He was one of the most famous, famous, in the way we think of it today, celebrities of his time. By the end of his life, Beethoven had become far more than a brilliant composer. He epitomized the struggle of the artist to overcome great odds for the sake of his art. Beethoven is not only the most popular composer of all time in some ways, but also one which people attach a real symbol as if he were the symbol of music itself. You know, an Englishman once said, talent is what a man possesses. Genius is what possesses a man. Beethoven was possessed. His reaction to the stimulus of life was unique. And we are the, we're the lucky ones. He's a man who, through all the struggle he went through, is able to elevate us in a way nobody else can because he went through hell. But he always managed to lift himself out of his agony through music, some of the grandest sounds the world has ever known. The Voyager spacecraft currently hurtling towards the outer edge of our galaxy carries on it Beethoven's music. When the Berlin Wall came down and the people of East Berlin came across to the West, it was to a concert of Beethoven's music. As long as mankind endures, they will turn to Beethoven's music. It is immortal. Some of the hair that was plucked from Beethoven's head at his death has become famous in its own right now.
It will be the subject of an upcoming book. Really? The hair has had a fascinating journey. It was, first of all, at one point used as payment for helping a Jew escape Nazi Germany. Today it is being tested scientifically to determine if there's any way to know what might have caused Beethoven's death. Well, while well, that's a matter of curiosity, it certainly isn't important. What was important, is important, and always will be is solely the music he gave us. Thank you.